I will just get right started with the topic. I mean, we, we picked like skepticism about power and statues and I thought it might be interesting before we go into all the formal introductions, if I um, give, like, give you a little task and I hope it's fun. Um, you will see in a second in the chat a link, okay? And then you follow that link. It will take you to a mural and I will share my screen meanwhile so that we all on the same page and you don't do anything yet. You just follow the link and hopefully you will see this screen here. Okay, I see, okay, lots of you are joining in the mural, so that's good. So now your task is, you can drag and drop some of these figures. So the question for you is where should these statues go? So if there's a statue of like, for example, this is Nietzsche here, where should they go? Should they go in our public parks or should we drop them in the river? Because obviously a lot of the controversy is what should we do with statues? If you don't know certain people, like of course this is Marx, here we have Mao, Nietzsche, Lukashenko, Gandhi, Churchill, Hume, Lenin, Genghis Khan, Aristotle, Heidegger and Kant. So let's see where they go and you can just drag and drop. If you disagree with some of your colleagues, uh, well, Kakjal, then you, you, <laughs> the first one has to, can, can do whatever they want. Okay, Lukashenko in the park. I'm, I'm, I'm appalled. This is like just hardcore trolling of me. I, like I, I'm based in Minsk right now. So let's see. Some people are revoking that judgment. <laughs> Good, Aristotle goes in the park. I see. Churchill goes in the park. David Hume goes in the park. Genghis Khan goes in the park. Okay, Mao Gandhi goes in the river. Well, I was not necessarily expecting that. Mao goes in the river. Marx was the first one in the river. Lenin we also have in the river. Heidegger, not so sure yet. And up, up there is still Nietzsche. So whoever feels like they can make a qualified judgment about Nietzsche, they can do so. And if you have very strong disagreements, you can still move that person a little bit to the center. Like for example, if you say, oh, maybe Marx doesn't belong really in the river uh, then, but in like the trash can of history, not just joking. Then you put him in the middle. Heidegger is in the middle. So now there's some adjustments. I give you like uh, 10 more seconds to make adjustments. Like for example, if you have like strong feelings like me about Kant getting like annoying me so much that throwing him in the river would be a good idea. You can move him to the right. Churchill, now nah, is getting moved to the right. So. And Lenin a little bit to the left. Lukashenko is far is now the, the furthest in the river. I think finally we have some agreement there. So Sasha is is drowning. I okay, they might record me, so I have to, to say a nice words again. Anyways, good. We have a good overview. Um, and I, I picked you not random figures. I picked figures that are controversial in that regard. Like if you follow the debate about statues, um, and we will contextualize that in a second, all of these figures have been mentioned. Like for example, Genghis Khan, if you look at the regime that he built up, he killed like the largest world population share that of, of all dictators, of all rulers of all times. Like the genocide um, that for example, um, the Young Turks did or the Holocaust that the Germans did is not comparable in terms of world population to Genghis Khan. Nevertheless, if you go to Mongolia, and I guess some of you have been, there's like crazy big statues like uh, regarding Genghis Khan, he's the national hero, the national beverages are linked to him. Um, Aristotle ju famously justified slavery in um, his writings. So of course he's controversial with painting people. Why should we put up a statue? And there are statues of Aristotle, obviously. If you have been to Thessaloniki, there are statues and, and many different places too. David Hume, recently there was a petition at the University of Edinburgh to remove David Hume, who also had certain views on slavery and like um, the, the superiority of Western culture. Uh, Kant, that's just random trolling. I don't think he's like really controversial, but like for everybody who has to study him, he's controversial. Heidegger, uh, open supporter of the Nazi regime. Therefore, some chairs of the universities have been renamed. Um, Nietzsche, equally controversial. Winston Churchill, this was the recent thing, like I usually teach in London and um, in London, this is like the big controversy, how we should think about Churchill on the one hand, won the second world war for the Brits, but on the other hand, what he did like in many different countries where the Brits were colonizing, uh, not so good on a track record. With Mao, Marx, I think it's obvious with Lukashenko also. Mahatma Gandhi is interesting because uh, Gandhi also highly praised in India. In many countries in, in Africa, they want to take down the statues of Gandhi. So if you look Gandhi and statues, you will find many interesting articles. So hopefully that gives us a little segue into today's topic. Let me just switch to my presentation. As I said, this will be um, a talk that will 
touch upon two different things. Like one, I want to talk a little bit and use this controversy about statues to talk about power and how we should think about the powerful and how liberal principles tie in here. Um, and it, it anchors to a lot of recent debates that we have. And I think debates that are also interesting for Eastern European, Russian, post-Soviet context, because uh, I mean, Ukraine was one of the countries where immediately after the revolution, um, the, the statues became like a central controversy and like taking down statues. So um, you can use the chat all the time to ask me questions, right? And like to like interfere, intervene, because when I go too fast or too quick, um, I think that might be helpful. So what I will talk about today um, will be statues. I will talk a little bit about the meaning of statues. Why is it such an interesting philosophical question, right? Like you might ask like, okay, why are we talking about statues? That's like a super random topic. Uh, I think it is good to learn about different philosophical concepts with statues in mind because statues represent ethical, political, social um, dimensions that we are often unaware of. And once you like really reflect upon it, you can learn a lot of the tools that we use in analytic philosophy. So we will first talk about the meaning of statutes. Then we will talk about uh, a fancy word called the semiotics of statutes. So semiotic is so similar to mean to meaning. It's like uh, the, the social meaning of, for example, like a symbol or like how statues are rendered into symbols because they are not just statues, but we will see that in a second. Then we will talk about power. And first we will link it to statues, but then we will abstract to the larger um, social context of power and why many political ideologies focus so much on power. Ultimately, power plays a big role in, I would say, uh, liberal thinking, but also in left-wing thinking. And then we will look at, I would say, the specific liberal value framework about skepticism about power, but it's less, less a lecture about liberalism um, and more like to raise awareness for the role of power in various ideologies. And my conclusion, because I don't I want to let you hang in is that uh, from these reflections about power and the role that statues have in societies, we might conclude that some statues have to go. What the criterion for that is, we will see in a second. So let's dive right into. So statutes, what they are and what they are not. So because I want to first hear what you think about statues before I kind of lecture you on this topic, I uh, send you to another website. And for that, you just open, I guess you're familiar with the tool, menti.com. So you don't need an app, you just do it in your browser like it can be on your smartphone and you go to menti.com the website and then it will ask you for a room code and there you type in 216185 so 216185 i also write that in the chat so 2161815 Good. So the first question, of course, is like just to, like to get an intuition, like where are you standing on this? But I, I already get a good feeling from the many of your responses where we are going here. Should we tear down those statues? Yes, most too. I mean, that's the radical progressive view, right? And then five say no, that's, I would say, more conservative view. And then it depends. That's the, that's a, I would say the philosophical view, like 20, it, or everything depends. Like, let me, let me know the argument first. Uh, that gives me a good indication. Okay, so we have a mixed, but most people are open to arguments. So that's, of course, already a good start. So let me jump to the next slide, which is more like serious. Um, I want to hear from you. What do statues represent to you? So if you see a statue, what does it represent to you? What do you think it, it represents? What does it reflect? Okay, so what do statues mean to you? What do they represent and reflect? So, and it's like a word cloud, so you can just like write your associations with it. Uh, in English would be the best. I know it might be more challenging, but like uh, that we get a good word cloud, it's best to do it in one language. So let's pick English. And um, just, I think up to 10 words you can write, so can be multiple. It's radical post-Soviet, not radical progressive. I, then, I mean, could also be, you know, radical social change, which is to a certain degree progressive. So I think it's uh, just more contextual. And of course, you can also write it in the chat. I'm monitoring a little bit historical memory. Memory. They're built in public spaces. They are tasteless. Art. Good. We have many different options. History. Commemoration. Yeah. Think of, especially if, uh, statues with people on it. I think this commemorations are already a great part. Like, so don't think of like necessarily memorials. 
So uh, memorials like uh, remembrance of the Holocaust or whatever, like in, in, in Yerevan about like the Armenian genocide, like this, I, um, I would say more memorials than statues. By statues, I really mean like display of like uh, human beings. Art, memory, history, political situation, promoted values, glimpse into the past, public spaces. It's like kind of an, like how to make public spaces beautiful. Let's put a statue there, right? One could think that, and apparently some Soviet, Soviet uh, social planners thought that might be a good idea. Glory, mm -hmm. memory. Story, like I guess the story of a nation that you want to tell. Importance of a person. So historical relevance, I would name that. Okay, we're going into a good direction. I, let me just quickly chat, 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 check the chat. Statues are not about the past, but about the present. They are as well. Yes, we will touch upon that. Monument is a, is a solidified rally. So I guess like political rally. Good. Okay. Good. I think there are many things that I will touch upon. Um, and I might just disagree with you on some. So let's see. So what are these statues representing? I think uh, these are a couple of the things that came to mind beforehand, right? I cannot just... Uh, um, uh, adjust to, to the word cloud that you have, but many of them are, are mentioned over here. And this is, I think, most of the time what we see in the uh, academic literature on the topic, right? Um, we could say that uh, a statue is there as the record of history. Like we only put people up that are of importance to history, right? So there's some link to history has to be there. So statues are a record of history or of historical importance, one might say. The next one is like they cherish certain actions that people did, right? Like they commemorate a, sp a specific act, like a heroic act or whatsoever. Um, there could be an artistic expression. So a statue is some form of art. We pick certain things that represent our like common memory and then we glorify it somehow. It could be uh, about the public contribution that some people did. It's not only like the specific actions, but specifically about the public actions that they did, right? Um, because in the end, we put it into public spaces. Like there are some people who like statues in their private homes, but that's not what we are concerned here. Like we are concerned with um, um, statues in the public space. That makes it also a political problem. Like if some weird people want to put a lot of statues in their gardens, I think that's less of a philosophical problem. Um, specific events, um, it could be linked that, okay, we cherish here like a historical date, like whatever, and therefore we put a, a statue of one person that represents that. And lastly, it says something about the person that is displayed there, something about their character. So let me run through these potential um, applications or meanings of statues and see how plausible that is. So one, and I think many of you said, well, a statue is a historical artifact. It's like a record of history of the importance of history. Well, maybe to a certain degree, but why are like some statues not there of some certain people? Like for example, I'm from Germany. So why are there no Hitler statues over here, right? Like, of course, importance to history, undeniable, right? And why is there no statue of Hitler? Like some people we don't put on a pedestal, right? We don't put up there. So record of history cannot suffice as a sufficient argument to say this ground statues that you are like just uh, keeping track of history and who is important to history because we leave certain people out and we take other people that may be of less significance, right? So record of history and historical importance is not sufficient to ground statues. Let's look at specific actions. Um, you could say, oh, well, a certain person did specific actions, um, but, and, and therefore we, we erect a statue for him or her, but um, that doesn't seem to ground either. Like, for example, suppose a person um, gets all his or her wealth through um, a child slavery ring, you know, like they are enslaving children to get all their wealth and then they do something good with it. Well, this action doesn't seem to be status worthy, right? Like we don't give statues to such people either. So it's not specific action. We make a more general assessment. So it's not only one action. We statue is something evaluative for a bigger, um, for a bigger frame. Is it an artistic expression? Well, I guess to a certain degree, it's used as a symbol of power as we will see, but um, they are not necessarily, like art is not necessarily the only thing that grounds certain things, right? Like there is a, a deeper political meaning often behind it. So artistic expression might also not suffice. So then specific events, um, as I said, with specific actions, that doesn't seem to ground. Like we don't celebrate a specific event and a person related to that because then we could pick potentially people who did something heroic on one day, but in general were like moral monsters. And that's also not something that we put up there. So that also doesn't seem to work. Um, and lastly, public contribution. Just think of the example that I just made about the, um, the person 
who grounds all their wealth in like something immoral like this child slavery ring or whatsoever, of course, we would also not put them up to a statue. So a statue is much broader. And that brings me to the last argument that we see in the literature and that I think most succeeds. A statue is the evaluation of the moral character on top of it. It evaluates, it signals something. It signals something glorifying. Many people of you wrote that in the word cloud as well. Something glorifying about that person as a whole, like for their moral character, right? or for their character overall. You don't necessarily have to get so um, hyped up on the, on the word moral here, but on their character. It's not like spe one specific thing that they did, but once we put them up there, we kind of glorify them as a person as a whole. And so our first conclusion from that kind of reflections, let us say that statues are not just import, like historical records. They are not just like historical memory. Um, there's something to that, something evaluative. We evaluate, not only the acts of the people that are displayed there, but we display their whole character, okay? So one step further, it's not just history, otherwise you cannot explain why, for example, Hitler would not be there or like other um, morally questionable leaders are not there, but we make a positive evaluation about the character of the person in question, okay, that we put out there. And they are like in a positive sense. Of course, we don't put up like negative examples. So statues seem to be always linked to a positive evaluation of that person and their character in specific. Okay, so this is like my first claim that I want to make. That seems to be the, the, the signal that a, statu a statue sends. Okay, this, let me just quickly check the chat. Uh, I wonder why we didn't talk and talk about this before Black Lives Matter. In fact, before Black Lives Matter, uh, quite some literature was published on this. So if you're interested, I can later on put a link in the chat with like relevant literature on the topic. I mean, there is some philosophical literature on whether we should actually take statues down. Like for example, Cecil Rhodes statue in Oxford, very famous controversy for I would say the last 10 years or something like that. So yeah, um, but I think the literature is very, uh, as any literature, very Eurocent, like, um, Anglo-Saxon centric. Anyways, so next, the next puzzle is, um, if you look at statues, you might say, okay, like maybe, uh, where does all this meaning come from? After all, we just have like stones, we have like clay, we have like metal. That kind of makes for most statues. I looked at that, like there's like, I'm, I'm living currently in Minsk, and in Minsk there's like an old museum about sculpturing, right? Like and how these leaders are sculptured, and you can take pictures with the, the sculptures in there. And like, these are just like stones, they are just like clay, or they are just artifacts of metal, right? How do they get their meaning, or where does this evaluation come from? And that's, that's an interesting question, because there is no objective way to like philosophically just say, okay, now this is the evaluation of this statue, because it seems to be so context dependent. Like a statue on a public square seems to be very different evaluated than if we put it in a museum. Like for example, here, this is a, like another picture from Minsk, like Lenin in front of the government building. Like there is, an evalu there is a statement that you want to signal there, and of course, at the time it was erected, it had a specific specific signal at that time. And that signal is very different from if we put Lenin as a statue or whoever you want to put in there in a museum. So this other one is, I think, like the, the statue graveyard in Estonia and like Tallinn. So different contexts determine the meaning and the evaluation of these statues. Like once we go to a museum and look at the statue of Cecil Rhodes or other like perpetrators, like it might be differently evaluated than when we put them into a public square, right? Because the historical memory aspect is much more important in a museum part. I wouldn't object maybe to like uh, 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 some Nazi statutes, and in fact, we have that in Germany, in museums, because we can contextualize. It's about learning about history, right? It's the right context for that. However, once they're erected on the public square, something else happens to them. So we cannot just say, oh, there's like an objective evaluation that is context independent for statutes. Instead, we have to understand that these um, things that are made out of very basic resources get unloaded with their meaning through the social discourse that we have about them. So the meaning of statues is socially constructed. And you don't have to buy into like crazy metaphysics for that. You don't have to say, oh, the whole world is socially constructed or whatsoever. You can be very moderate about that and just say, okay, like statues are certain symbols that we have that the meaning and the con uh, is, depend is socially constructed dependent on uh, the time slice and the context in which they are displayed. Okay, so that's the second conclusion that we can make. Uh, the, the evaluation that we draw is socially constructed. Again, in a museum, very clear, we learn about uh, history, it's a historical memory, while in a public square, it's glorifying, right? It has some evaluation of what, what is good about that character and their role into, in history. Okay, I hope that all makes sense.
So the next one is, I just said, it's not only po um, evaluation, it's a positive evaluation, like because we don't put like statues of like bad human beings up there. Um, and in fact, you see like statues are loved by a specific crowd, right? Like there are some people who are like really like ambivalent about, or like they don't really care about statues, but one crowd that really cares about um, um, statues you see here. So this is like, for example, in North Korea, or like this is a former statue of Saddam Hussein that you saw like going down uh, in the aftermath of the Iraq war or here down there, like this Turkmenistan and the Turkmenbashi. So certain people, they're obsessed with, uh, with statues. And I like this quote by um, Graham West, which basically explains why we also use these statues as a political tool. And he says, in all revolutions, the vanquished are the ones who are guilty of treason, even by the historians for history is, and this is important now, for history is written by the victors and framed according to the prejudices and bias existing on their side. So of course, what he says here is history is written by the victors and like the people who erect these kind of memories of what is good, you know, and like the moral character of this particularly important person are the ones that are dominant at a certain time frame, that there are ones that are in power. So finally, we arrived at a little conclusion that statutes are not erected by some random people, right? Like we don't erect like statues. Er statues are erected by those in power. And those in power can not, do not necessarily have to be like dictators or people in, like on top of the chain of the political ladder, but they can also reflect just dominant beliefs, right? Those in power can be a larger group. It doesn't have to be like, as I mentioned, these dictators, but it can be a larger dominant set of beliefs. So for example, you can make that, um, the link to the United States where you can say, um, the dominant beliefs are uphold by the story that uh, white people in the United States want to uphold, right? Um, this is like the, their story. And this kind of omits certain other figures that we would not put on a statue, right? And therefore it's a power dimension. Like the ones that are in power determine which character, to jump back here, which character, are worthy of mentioning and to put up on statues. So it, the statue is not only that it is about evaluation of a character, but it's also chosen by those in power who is worthy of character, okay, and who's worthy of historical relevance here. So it has all these dimensions to it. And when you're in the beginning, look at statues, you just see like, okay, that's like some, some bad taste stuff that we see in public parks. But if you follow my argument so far, then it's actually quite interesting um, what's going on uh, with statutes, and I will summarize my argument in a second. Um, just one side remark, think of these remarks that I'm making about statutes right now, and think about whether they can apply to history too, and the way we rewrite history and the way we use history as a symbol, because I also do a lot of work on populism, and populism see always the same thing. They always want to try to rewrite parts of history, right? Like in, Putin's agenda right now with Poland seems to be rewriting parts of World War II, or if you look at Modi in India, they really want to reclaim the history of India, like rewrite it, right? And that's like basically following from these remarks that Graham West West, like the, the ones that are in power, try to reformulate the sort of the history in the way they want. But anyways, that's just a side remark. So far, we are in our argument um, at this point where we say, well, statues, they are evaluative. They make a certain evaluative judgment, okay? And that's like normative. And I guess you're all familiar with what normative means. Normative are value judgments, either moral or aesthetic, but anything where values are in. So they are not factual, but um, value-based. So statues are evaluative, always in a positive sense. The evaluation of these uh, statues is socially constructed. It's not like you can um, determine by reasoning objectively what uh, evaluation of a statue is universal in time. That doesn't seem to make sense. Again, think of my example of like erecting a statue in a public square and having a statue like in a museum. That seems to be different and the meaning of these statues seem to be precisely linked to the context they are displayed in. And statues are used by those in power to reflect power structures. So that's basically following from my last remarks about who actually erects these statutes and who picks which um, which characters are of, uh, of worthy of our moral appreciation, okay? So what this concludes in our first step here is statues are, and now comes a fancy word, but I said already what it kind of means, are semiotic expressions of power. So you can just reframe that to something easier and say statutes are symbols of power. 
if you follow, that seems to follow from all that I'm saying, right? They are evaluative, they are erected by the powerful, and the meaning is socially constructed. So that means that the powerful can influence what the meaning of these things are. So they are just nothing else than signals of power, okay? And once we understand that they are just not historical artifacts, but signals of power, we understand where the whole controversy comes from. Why certain people feel so offended by walking by like a, a statue of their former oppressors, right? Why people want to take that down. Why in Ukraine, they wanted to take down old, old Soviet um, uh, statues, right? Or why in the United States, the Confederate uh, state, um, statues are under fire. So once you understand there is much more than clay, stones, and metal to statues, you will understand they are expressions of power. Okay, so that's the first part that we hopefully covered. And I hope that makes sense. So now let's dive into the second part because like signals of power, you might say, okay, so what? Like what's wrong with power? So, I mean, needs explanation, right? Philosophically. So let's dive right into that. Um, this is part of a, a bigger thing that I'm doing on like the values of liberalism. If you're interested in that, like just contact me, I can give you some resources on this. And as you see on, on part three, what I think is the part of, um, of uh, the liberal value framework is skepticism about power. So that's kind of where I use this to, to anchor most of the remarks that I'm making about the paradigm of liberal democracy, where I'm saying how we should deal with statues. So skepticism about power, as I said, is a liberal value. And what that basically means is, well, sidetrack, maybe before we go into what it actually means, let us explain what power is. Before, because before you know what you should be skeptical about, you, know, you should know what power actually is that you're skeptical of. So power is the following. I think that's my, my best guess on how to, to, um, to describe it. Power is if you force others to do what you want, if you make others to do what you want. So not like helping them to do what they want, but you make them do what you want. That's kind of power. If you have the ability to make others do what you want, that's what we describe usually as power. And like here, this is like my own words, but here you find the same in Bertrand Russell. It's like, for example, power is maybe defined as the production of intended effects. Like if you produce the intended effects in others, that's like you have power over them, right? And uh, Dennis Wrong, who also wrote famously on power, he writes, and I think that's uh, the best definition that I've seen. Power is the capacity of some persons to produce intended and foreseen effects in others. So power is not only like you force others at gunpoint, but it's also you manipulate them to do a certain things like right? foreseen effects, you know, intended effects, incentives to produce certain things. So once you have power, you can do others, you can make others do what you want. And that's crucial. They make certainly now what you want and they don't do what they want necessarily. So that's like the definition of power that I would use. And why should we be skeptical about that? Um, let me just quickly check, check in the chat. Good. So, I mean, power plays a big role in, in philosophy. You know, I guess many of these figures like uh, uh, Nietzsche obviously um, like talked about the will of power, will to power. Foucault basically analyzed everything in society from the perspective of power. For him, science was power. Or like uh, medicine was power structure, stuff like this. Um, you see Judith Butler, like modern Marxism or modern feminism is all about power. So keep in mind that power is an in incredibly influential topic in philosophy. And like there you saw also Machiavelli, who's very influential in terms of thinking about power. But I would say power is fundamentally linked to also principles like liberalism. Because liberty, the basic value of liberalism is nothing else than and you see that down here, is the non-dependence or the independence of arbitrary power of others. So if you read that, you already see that the concept of power is something that liberals by definition are, for example, skeptical about. So liberals tend to be skeptical of power because for them, liberty to live a free life is to be independent of the dependence on the powers of others, right? Like I'm, like I'm free once I'm independent of the arbitrary power of others. So the fundamental concept of liberalism is very much grounded in power and many other different ideologies ground themselves into power. So power is a fundamentally interesting and relevant concept that we see in philosophy. And you see that like playing out in much of the literature on colonialism, patriarchy, you know, stuff like that. So let's return to the skepticism about power and why we should be skeptical about it. Um, we need in society certain structures, right, that we have, like, for example, hierarchy and authority. We need to grant that in the business context, but also in the political context, okay? But 
once you grant hierarchy and authority, they can have a flip side to it, namely domination and exploitation. So once you grant hierarchy in society, in society or once you grant authority, there's always the flip side that this can be abused, okay? And this could lead to domination and exploitation. So once you're aware of that flip side of power, you know that this can be abused, okay? And that's why we should be skeptical about it in especially the liberal framework. I like this quote by Lord Acton. He says, great, great men are almost always bad men. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And now to bring that a little bit back to statues, you already see why, for example, in a liberal framework, you might be very skeptical of statutes in general, like as a default, because what Acton says here, great men are almost always bad men because we put people up that were not random. People were put up by either those in power or because they were in power. And because power has this specific force to it, like often we say the sweet scent of power, that power corrupts you, uh, you know that they have some moral baggage to them. It's not that these people are always great in terms of their moral character. And if this is true, that statues evaluate the moral character, you already see that the moral character for them might be in fact be corrupted. And that seems to be problematic. So from a liberal perspective, and I would say this is the, the basic understanding of many liberal democracies, which is the paradigm in contemporary political philosophy, um, we should be very skeptical of anyone who is erected on a statue. Because as we see here, great men are almost always bad men, but we always put great men, in fact, that's even, you don't have to be sensitive of the gender here because it's most of the time really great men. Great men are almost always bad men. They are put up there by those in power to make an evaluative statement about what they did at this specific time slice to kind of give the public belief that these are great work, like glorifying persons, right? So it's a, a dimension of power that is exercised through erecting the statutes. So I will skip that a little bit. If you're interested in the psychology of why power is, um, is so um, interesting, uh, let me know. I will also um, share the slides later on so you have access to all of that. So what does that mean um, in terms of exercise of power? Um, Powerful belongs to the, to the uh, power obviously belongs to the powerful, but this can take different manifestations. Like to make others do what you want, you can do that in many different dimensions. You can do that, of course, in the political, where the state makes me do what the state wants, or the polit politicians make me do what they want. But you also have that in an economic sphere, right? You don't only have political power, but also economic power structures. Like uh, the people who are in charge of businesses can force their employees to do what they want. So they have certain economic powers. For example, if you don't follow my orders, I will just um, like cancel the employment contract. And of course, social powers are there as well. Like think of the patriarchy. There um, um, you have very clear relationship of men, women, um, for example, uh, that women are dependent on the men as the breadwinner or something like that, right? Like the social powers are very clearly display, displayed. So things can take different shapes. And I think for statues, we are mainly occupied with the political and social dimension to it. Because I mean, there are sometimes business leader put up there on statues, but mostly it is used by politics because ultimately where are statues displayed? They are displayed in the public sphere. So I would say, from these remarks, we can conclude that symbols of that statues are symbols of political and social power. I hope that all makes sense so far. So that brings me to my kind of concluding remarks. How should we think about these statutes? And from the perspective that I said about power and that the, the meaning of statutes that I elaborated on. Well, statues are evaluative. I hope we understood that they make a certain judgment about the character of the person displayed. They make a positive statement. By erecting a statue, by the very fact that you erect that statue, you make an evaluative statement of the character of the person displayed. So that's number one. Statues are semiotic dis dis uh, expressions of belief and power structures. So they are signals of power structure. Like once we put up, we say this specific person represents what we as society are the ones that are in power right now determine as good. Okay. So it's not like that, you know, minority voices are put up on statutes. It's always the dominant belief structures. Then 
and then I sneak in here a, a judgment for myself, certain power structures entail moral wrongdoing. So if you followed my remarks about Lloyd Acton, we often see that the great, men's of, the great men of history often have done morally questionable things, right? Like a lot of the power structures that we have seen entail moral wrongdoing. So Cecil Rhodes, um, I don't know what, how familiar you are with him, but Cecil Rhodes was like a British colonizer and he did, of course, a great, a lot of things in donating to Oxford University, but he did so because he was exploiting South Africans, right? And so he did serious rights violations. And for many historical fig figures, that is the case. Like maybe Aristotle couldn't have written his treatises if he wouldn't have owned slaves. Although of course, for Aristotle it's questionable whether he did own in, in, uh, in person, but you can make that case obviously, right? So some of these people that put, were put up there and have uh, committed serious wrongdoings. And liberal democratic societies, I would argue, are committed to precisely condemning that. They should not put up uh, statues of people that committed serious wrongdoings. That means, from my perspective, to give you a little bit of things to argue with me, statues of serious wrongdoers, which might be if we follow Lord Acton, ought to be removed. There is a good case to be made to remove most of the statutes because most great men of history have been erected by those who were in power at a specific time frame, but nevertheless committed serious wrongdoings. And once we type this, this framework that I just present here in my argument um, on, we would have to remove a lot of the people that we currently even erect statutes to. So this leaves me with a couple of open questions for you because we aim for like a little bit of a discussion for like 20 minutes or so. Um, what are, how should we deal with this? First of all, should all statues go down? Um, let's think of, for example, examples like Julius Caesar or like Roman statues. Of course, um, the Romans have imposed their rule upon Germans, right? But it's so far in the past, I have no connection to them. Like if whenever I walk by a, a, a Roman statue, I don't have any feelings about it, right? I mean, I might even admire it for its beauty, but in the I stay one select person by a state a statue, they might have links. How do you make sense out of this? Like, does time play a role here? Does context play a role? I don't know what to think about this. This may be a question also for you, how you think about it. Is there a difference? Should we just take like all like statues down? Um, how far should we go? Um, who removes? Is there, can only the state remove or should like everybody be able to remove? So for example, if I feel offended by a certain statue of Louis Julius Caesar, it reminds me of like dire German past under like the, the, um, the rule of the Romans. Um, should I be able to take that down or can only the government do it? Or how should we think about that? So that's another question for you. Um, what counts as a wrongdoing? You know, some people have done more or less serious wrongs. You know, some people have uh, uh, maybe exploited workers for their wealth, but then they contributed greatly to society. Um, or if you look into like even Einstein, like Einstein had like some anti-Semitic remarks in his career, like do these remarks of a scientist qualify that he has done a serious wrongdoing? How should we think about it? Like all, like all appreciation to Einstein should go down or how should we think about this? Uh, or lastly, maybe a suggestion. Instead of taking old statues down, maybe we just erect new statues, you know, like to, to, to bring our beliefs in there. Now we seem to be at a certain degree, at least in some societies in power. So we just can erect new statues, right? To, to make up for all of that um, and bring in our moral evaluation of what we think um, are great people. And so we balance out the, all the old weird guys with new great statues. So these are a couple of things that I found interesting from all my remarks and I hope my reflections helped you to think more about the topic. Um, and now you can ask questions, make remarks, also take it in any direction you want. So I don't know who, who wants to moderate, but uh, I, I would be open to have now some questions and some discussion. And I'm looking at the chat right now. Hey, hello. Thank, hey. you. Thank you for the lecture, it was really interesting. Can I just real quick ask one question? Uh, do you think maybe it's appropriate not to tear down statues, but to add some sort of a disclaimer? Like this man was, was bad <laughs> at this and this and this point, but also we can't not appreciate what he did for the science, if you're talking about Einstein or what he did for the democracy, if you're talking about like Thomas Jefferson or someone else. So this may be the solution. Yeah. So 
so you could just say, um, okay, like uh, we, we can change and give some context. We can make the kind of museum style for our public spheres, right? Like there's now a statue of Lenin, but uh, we, we, we put some like disclaimer next to it, like a, like a, a little plague. And there it's written all the things that also like bad come out of it and good things came out of it and you can make your own judgment, right? Well, I might be skeptical about that because if you jump back to what I said here earlier on, and uh, sorry, I have to wait, maybe that's quicker if I scroll up. Um, you will see what I say about the evaluative nature of here. So my argument here is to a certain degree to say, okay, maybe I have to reshare my screen one sec because I don't think you can sh see my screen. So good, now you should see it again. So on this slide, I basically argue the following. I said uh, a statue by its fact of a statue is always evaluative of the moral character. It's not like, oh, you can just render the social meaning of it uh, easily, right? Because once it is a statue in the public sphere, it, it's kind of honoring the person, right? It has a certain evaluative dimension to it. So even if I put a plague up there and like try to contextualize, the public sphere is the wrong place for it. I would say, then why not moving it to a museum altogether? If like a, like a figure is like has a, many different aspects to them. Maybe the museum is the right way where I can contextualize it. But once I put and direct something in the, in the public sphere, it seems to me that the clear understanding is that is a moral evalu like a, char a character evaluation that we put out there. So I think that might be the concern here. I see what, where you're coming from and many cities debated that in the United, in the United Kingdom, there was um, many discussions about these slave traders and um, they didn't want to remove the statue, but instead wanted to put more plagues in there. And then the community who was against it said, well, you know, it's nevertheless honoring the person. You don't erect a statue for like a person who is like morally so-and-so, <laughs> you know, like who has a mixed background. That's like not what a statue does, they would argue. And I think that's persuasive, but I also see where you're coming from. So I think it's a legitimate argument. However, this is what somebody um, uh, more skeptical about your claim might respond. I hope that makes it clear. So if you're... Yeah, thank you. I mostly agree with you actually now. Good. I think that's what the debate is, if it would be raised. Um, yeah, whoever wants to go next, feel free. I don't know. I see some people have hands, so maybe I pick them. Like I have Danielle and then Anastasia. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, so I have a question. So don't you reignite the debate or support for a specific person or their actions or something when we try to bring the statues down or uh, move them to a different place? Wouldn't the support for and the memory for all of these people die down if we leave them alone and afterwards, uh, like there is no way everybody uh, in the country would hold hands and uh, agree on a specific person on their actions, on their moral, uh, on their morals of this person. Yeah. So, so I, I take your remarks as you could take basically one route. Like you could say, uh, either we take all statues down, that seems to be like, okay, from all the things that I said, or you can take no statues down because otherwise, you know, you cannot really agree. So let's <coughs> take all of them up, right? Um, again, um, I, I think it's philosophically plausible. However, I think in, in public, um, that might be very offensive to some people. So let's say you are like part of a vulnerable minority. You're still struggling from the forms of discrimination that you're experiencing today. Like for example, the uh, black African community in the United States. Like if they have to walk by a, a statue by like slave traders or like people who have committed serious wrongdoings, that seems weird. Like think again, like how would Germany be if we said, oh, maybe, you know, we cannot take down all statues or so some Hitler statues have to remain there. Okay, and then like, how would the Jewish people feel in Germany? Like, seems to be weird, right, to say that. Um, and that's why I always say, don't underestimate the semiotic dimension of it, right? It signals something about the society. If a society like, like Germany uh, would still have all the Nazi symbols everywhere, like people would say, oh, guys, you didn't do your effort to come to terms with your past. You didn't make a right move in terms of reconciliation with the past. So I write my dissertation about um, historical wrongdoings and how we should deal with um, historical wrongdoings. And I think a lot of it, uh, like statues actually shows, like once you take them down, well, we are acknowledging what we have done in the past as a wrongdoing. And therefore this is an act where we show we take them down. Of course, this doesn't help the Holocaust survivors, but it's an act that shows that we are coming to terms with our history. And I think this, this dimension cannot be under, underestimated uh, in, in its role in the public discourse. I don't know, I'm not sure that makes sense to you, Daniel. 
Uh, well, it makes sense, uh, like in, in most cases, just that uh, I'm not quite sure about the story about the bronze soldier uh, in Estonia. Uh, like there was some debate about it, then they wanted to move uh, the bronze soldier to a different place. Uh, but before that, it's like it, people just forgot about it in kind of in some kind of way, and it wasn't like a symbol of something at that point. But when they decided to move it and, be, and became a, even a bigger symbol, and they had to leave it in, in place, they had to leave it there. Yeah, I think you know, like the same the same is with like the Confederate statues or like Chris. Christopher Columbus in the United States, like a lot of times, like people didn't have like a, a specific association, but now it cooks up. And I think um, like such artifacts are always expression for underlying tensions in society, you know? Um, of course, like these things will pop up once things get relevant again. And once you talk about um, uh, Black Lives Matter or like justice uh, in that sorts of considerations, um, it's just an artifact that, that signals or symbolifies this debate. So at one point it would pop up, I think, you know, like it's just like, oh, everybody forgets about it. And then it will be like Julius Caesar. I think um, the way our liberal democratic societies tick might be different. And I think actually it's an excellent point that you're making. Um, because what I'm talking about here mostly is about liberal democratic societies where you have public engagement with the topic, right? Um, and uh, that's what I'm assuming. So we cannot have like that's Julius Caesar or like Roman statues are like there forever and we kind of forget about it because the past rulers didn't allow us to discuss this part of our history, right? In liberal democratic societies live that we engage with the things that are there in public. So we look at all the artifacts that are there in the public sphere, in our parks or whatsoever, the art that we are displaying. So it's a, um, I would say a discursive element, uh, like an element of public discourse. And I think what I say here most of the time applies to liberal democratic society. So I think your, your reminder is actually very spot on. So thanks for that. Um, then I have Anastasia next and then Sergey. Sven, thank you so much for your lecture. It was very interesting. I actually have two questions. First one is uh, continuing this comment about past and um, like, because like when you mentioned that uh, now when we see these Roman statues, we don't like uh, we don't have any specific feelings, but about like Lenin or some statues from the like not so uh, like from the uh, past that was like uh, like uh, one hundred years ago. Uh, it was like it it feels for us much more real. So that's why we want to like move these statues. So maybe it's like mm, so it's the. As I understood, it's the problem only about the time. So if, for example, some statues will survive, so maybe like in 500 years, or I don't know, like 1000, uh, if there will be any status of Hitler or like, I don't know, like of some, any other rules that we don't like now, uh, for, for those people in the future, for them, it will be like, well, okay, like we don't feel anything specific. Yeah, I think that follows kind of from the last reflections that I had also with Daniel before, right? Um, I think it's a, it's like, it, it would be a, a, a comforting thing to think like, okay, let's wait this out for like another hundred years and then like this whole issue will be gone, right? Um, because Genghis Khan, right? I was in Mongolia, like Genghis Khan is everywhere, you know, but like if you look at how much of the world population this guy killed, it's like a pro proper stuff, you know, like... Uh, uh, it's like one might say a moral monster, right? And then you might say, oh, different times. And, you know, like now we, we glorify that person, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think what we have to understand is, I guess, modern liberal democratic societies are different, right? Like they have a different shape. We cannot just have like one, 100 or 200 years where we don't discuss like how we as a nation have done our history, right? We cannot just like wait, and now is King X and then is King Y in charge. And like nobody discusses the way of history. There's no democratic history there, right? One guy on the top defines like what is history. Um, and that's what the populists, by the way, also want to do. Like they want to shape the next narrative of the nation, right? There's no democratic discourse about, you know, how should we as a nation think about our history? Like we in Germany, again, like I take Germany as an example because it's such a paradigm example. Um, like we have a discussion about our history until today, how we should think about it. Can we ever be proud or like, you know, all of these nuances you have in like um, in our education system, you have it everywhere. And um, once this is established, this liberal democratic framework, 
um, I think you cannot escape and say, okay, we don't, uh, we will now sit out one or 200 years of our past. That worked in the past with more authoritarian top-down structures. And that's why we don't feel much about like Aristotle or something like that, you know, or like the, the Romans, right? But in our modern liberal democratic societies, I think it is crucial to come to terms with our history and like to, to, to shape the narrative of a nation. And I think that is, is much more actually uh, uh, an argument for democracy um, then it's often it, it is presented because now we engage as democratic citizens with our past, we engage with our history, we, we, we have the power to do so, right? Uh, we discuss it in our education systems, we discuss it in public, and um, that's very different from the past where we just followed like what was presented as the history, right? Um, so uh, I think very interesting. I, I would also think more about this uh, because uh, I think you're after something, there's something important. Good. Uh, Sarah, uh, okay. Oh yeah, please, please. Yeah, Sorry. I have a second question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, just your slide with uh, the statue of David uh, by Michelangelo made me think that I know that uh, this statue was like uh, comm commissioned by a Medici family who were like not really democratic family, you know, but they commissioned like not themselves, for example, but like some symbol from the past so maybe I was just thinking that maybe now we can like have this like way when we uh, like we don't want to put our rules but th then they can commission some art and like put it like mm, is it clear like I mean I was just thinking that it's like very interesting that uh, some of the rules uh, they uh, do not uh, put themselves but they like uh, put some interesting symbols from the past and now we still like have it and for us it's like an art and we even do not think much about like uh, what they did. Like yeah. I mean, it always depends, right? Like it depends where it is, right? Like if we have in an art museum, if I go to the British Museum of History or whatever, you know, like I, I'm, I'm, I look at a statue from the aesthetic perspective, right? Like how were people glorified in terms of their body structure, right? I don't look like necessarily at their moral character. I think, and I think that's what I want to make you um, uh, think about with this slide is like once we put out a statue in the public sphere there's an evaluative dimension about the character of that person right it's not only their historical importance but it is put by those who were able to do so because we think that they were like praiseworthy in philosophical terms right and that gives it a different dimension to it it's not only art right because like statues in terms of the art artistic evaluation work differently and then you might also find different ways you don't have to put a person there you can have different memorials for artistic reasons right um but if you put a person there there's always this this character dimension and what should be considered praiseworthy which is often again linked to this conception of power because the ones in power determine what is praiseworthy like uh, for example he was a great patriot or something like that I hope that makes sense. Um, so I, I think that's where I, I like this slide is maybe amongst the most important ones because this shows you in which direction I see statues going and how they are perceived in public. And this is often a little bit also antagonistic to what people of you wrote in the word cloud, which was more like, oh, it's a record of history and da da da. But I think there's much more to it. And I hope I made that clear. Good. Um, then Sergei next and then Omori. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, thank you for your lecture. Really, I really have enjoyed it. And um, personally, I, I don't really care about status. I mean, I don't feel hurt when that happens. I mean, uh, but I have a question about how you feel about the specific practice of um, demolishing monuments without discussing with uh, local communities. I mean, it hurts a lot of people, and I, I want to ask how you see the certain practice of how we should do it. I mean, um, should there be a discussion, or maybe we should, uh, uh, I mean, how, how specific practice of this should be, um, take place, you know? I mean, uh, uh, regarding BLM, uh, we see that, um, any alternative um, view on that question uh, will, will um, result in accusations of racism, for example. I mean, it's very hard to discuss it in some places. No, I, I, that's an excellent question. So maybe first about like uh, whether 
like you care or not care about statues. I mean, I'm the same. I don't really care about statues. Like, like I have plenty of pictures. Like whenever I go to like a country, like I take pictures of the statues. Like I, I feel this is interesting, right? But I don't feel offended or necessarily whatever, you know? Um, yeah. But I mean, I see it from a societal perspective, it has a semiotic dimension, even if it doesn't work for you, right? Like this has a certain meaning to other people. And maybe because they live, they are still living through certain forms of that discrimination that originated there, um, they might feel very differently about it. So um, I think that's crucial to understand about the social meaning. Like uh, people get so riled up. I mean, in the United Kingdom, when this uh, the statue of Colston was taken down in Bristol, um, like it's crazy how many people went up there they're taking it down, celebrating the, the taking down. And then the next day, the far right Nazis gathered to dive into the river to take the statue out of the river. You know, I, <laughs> okay. I mean, it's also a stupid idea to take such a heavy statue out of the river because you can po not possibly lift that. But like the way it riled up people, the way it emotionalized people should not be underestimated. Okay, that's my first disclaimer. But about your second question, which is excellent. Who, who, who should do that? Um, should we allow these people to just take down statues like we see now in the United, uh, United States that people are just taking down statues? Um, and I think that's the wrong approach. In a liberal democratic society, everything is done by public reason, right? Like you have a social public discourse about it. Um, and sometimes that may take time, right? Um, like in Bristol, there was a petition for many years um, to take him down. Um, but it wasn't yet implemented. And then they just took matters in their own hands. And I don't think that this will bolster the future of democracy long-term because in the end, it's a discursive element. You bring in arguments in favor, you bring arguments against, and that's already a benefit in itself that you debate the statue and the role of the statue in society is already a benefit, right? Um, so I'm, I'm highly in favor of that local communities um, come to a joint decision in a democratic procedure. That's the solu that seems to be the solution to me. That seems to be upsetting to some uh, because I see the bad repercussions of that, that for example, Oxford didn't do many years something about Cecil Rhodes and now after the protests were, were there with them threatening to take it down, they finally took it down and the same in Bristol. Um, but, I mean, democracy is hard, right? And like, I, I think the long-term benefits of a democratic procedure is better than some people take matters in their own hands because uh, otherwise you have a slippery slope that we take everybody down and then it will just be like civil war in society. I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Then I have Omori. Uh, yeah, hello, Mr. Gers. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I just have uh, several questions. I'll, I'll structure it this way. Um, you know, when you uh, told us uh, the uh, fantastic information you've told us, I was like, it reminded me of uh, a very old book by Walter Scott, uh, Old Mortality, yeah? And the basic idea of old mortality in the beginning of the book is that uh, some people uh, deceased, yeah, a long, long time ago. They usually do not make us sad, yeah, since they are deceased long, long time ago. And maybe uh, the statues, uh, really, uh, since nobody uses those statues as uh, places for pilgrimage, people don't usually go there to pray. Yeah, uh, people usually remember about statues when they want to demolish them uh, in situations like we can observe now or, and in several countries. Uh, but uh, what if it's just uh, a tombstone? Yeah, what is just like a mere representation of power that existed long time before, but which is that now? Yeah, and uh, it doesn't, maybe it's actually better not to remove statues and not and, and to discuss the role of statue as a tombstone more since uh, it also reminds us of that power which it represents uh, does not exist anymore, for example. Yeah, I think some aspects I... I, I already covered, I would say, I would say um, you're certainly right. If, if the meaning of a, of a statue would be that it is like a tombstone, you know, but I, I think the way a statue is, it's not like that we can just change the meaning one second to the other, right? Like semiotic dimensions are so complex because they evolve over time spontaneously. So that, that means you cannot just say, okay, I click now and now we think of statues not as honorations of character anymore, but we think about it as tombstones, right? Like if that would work, it would be great, but that's not how um, I would say um, social meaning works. Like it comes over time, historical, emergent, spontaneously. So you cannot plan it, right? There's not one central planner who can say, we think about item X in that way. And from now on, that's the, that's the case. Well, that doesn't work like this. So I think to reconstruct this meaning dimension of statues, you might need a whole project, you know, how to, 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 to think about about um, uh, statutes in the future. And I'm not sure this, is, uh, this will be uh, a good way to, 
to do things. I think what is more important is maybe to dive more into why are certain statues more objectionable than others. And I think um, part of it is not only like how much time has passed, but also how much of the social power is still visible. Because I talked about that these are representations of social powers, right? Um, and like for the for the black community in the United States, they take offense because the power structure is still visible, right? Like there are more police crimes against um, uh, black people in the United States, for example, like that's just one manifestation um, of that power structure. However, if that power structure is broken, like Julius Caesar and the Romans over Germany, like we don't really care about it. So it's not only like the time, it's also whether the, 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 the power structure is still visible or not, right? And I think that might, might eliminate or like might give us more illumination into what these statues really represent. And I think much of it is also really linked to how visible are these power structures in, in societies con constantly, which gives a little bit more, more um, credibility to my claim about power, right? That they are also a symbol of power. Um, so I hope that that makes kind of sense. Also, by the way, there's a nice book, uh, Ernest Becker, on, I think, defeating immorality, immortality, or not, defeating mortality, that's how it's called. Um, and there he talks that statues are like a way for you to overcome mortality, because you will always be remembered as a person. So he, he really makes that claim, like it's about the character. It's not about one specific act that you did, or like your uh, historical relevance to that place, blah, 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 but it's like really about your character that you represent. Okay, cool. I hope that helps. I'm reading the chat right now. I, I think we have like five more minutes, but like, I don't know who gives me instructions how long I still have. Um, I would just browse quickly through the chat to see if there's some urgent topics. Valeri asks, do you think we should extend the same thinking to other signs of power? Um, like for example, on a dollar bill? Yes, I would say this applies the same. I think I picked statues for a specific reason um, because everybody now is familiar with it. Many people have not thought about statues so much. Uh, there's not so much philosophical literature. So I didn't take that because I'm obsessed with statues. Like I, I, as I said earlier, I don't care so much about statues, but I think it's a great way to understand semiotics, to understand socially constructed meaning, how it is about democratic di discourse. I think there are a lot of interesting um, political philosophy concepts intertwined to it. Um, and, but I, and I think it extends to many different other things uh, that are symbols of power. So once you study more into like semiotics and the, the symbolism, you will see how power structures are intertwined into that. Um, I mentioned briefly the role of history and how history is rewritten. I mean, unfortunately, Russia is a prime example for how you unload history with the narrative that you want to give, right? Um, certain things are not uh, like, <laughs> are not in that history book that should be there. And um, like the way Putin uses history to tell a certain narrative about the glory of the nation uh, is precisely understanding that. He, he understands that power and history through unloading with the, with the semiotic dimension of history like works miracles. So, yeah, so there's no, I mean, up, up to you how, I have roughly 10 more minutes. So if you have any urgent questions, you can ask them here. I will just still check the, the chat. Um, the disclaimers I tackled, we should think of a different form of appreciation. Um, Paulina asks, yeah, I mean, maybe there might be different arts of uh, uh, forms of appreciation. Sure. Uh, but again, what like forms of appreciation that sustain time and that are visible in public, obviously statues, like <laughs> people thought about what forms of appreciation will sustain over time and are visible to the public and statues is one manifestation of it. But I think we can invent multiple others. I would be curious to hear from you what, what other forms of appreciation we should bolster more. Um, I think it's a big problem for modern society that we are not appreciating sometimes the leaders anymore. Like, we, of course, there's glorification of the past and has its dangers, but we, we are slipping into an age of uh, anti-heroism. A lot of the TV characters that we are presenting are like cynical anti-heroes, right? Like think of Breaking Bad or what's sort of a house of cards. There's like no heroic figure. So I don't think like everything has to be an Ayn Rand novel where like you glorify the people, but uh, maybe this is also not the right way to go. So I think that's a good, um, good thing to think about what are forms of appreciation. Good. Tamina asks about vandalism. Yes, I, that's what I mean by like taking vandalism versus public discourse. I think like taking matters in your own hands um, might sometimes be justified. If you want to read more about this, Helen Froh has a nice paper. I can link to that. Um, but ultimately, I would say uh, public discourse is preferable and leaving it to the local communities is, I think, the way to go if you want to have sustainable 
um, democratic practices and I get also everybody involved. I think the good thing about statues is it is a discursive element. Once people talk about the statues, they become aware of the history, they become a hair of the legacy, it can bring in different multiple viewpoints. So I think it's interesting from so many layers of perspectives. Omori, why would you, why would anybody want to remove a statue they don't like if they may leave it and allow pigeons to de <laughs> defecate on it? Yes, I mean, it could be. Um, Nevertheless, of course, the bigger meaning of the moral glorification is out there. But I mean, if you want to let the pigeons do their stuff on it, yes, it sounds good. Uh, Daniel, what do we do with scholarships which are named for some controversial person, especially if their money funds with it? Yes, I think that's again the Rhodes Scholarship uh, for, for, the, uh, for Oxford or for the United Kingdom in general. Uh, yeah. It's, I would say it's the same question, right? Um, I would say it's a symbol of power that we name certain things about it. Like, why do we name a scholarship after a person? To appreciate, right? To give them recognition. Is this recognition for what? Like, just because they funded it? Well, maybe we give it because they stand for like the excellence that we associate with that. Like, for example, especially when it comes to a university with like um, academic excellence, like moral virtue, stuff like this, you know? Um, so if they violate all these principles, it seems to me that um, this will also be removed in the future. So I think this will just follow even more straightforwardly. But if you have different thoughts, let me know. Like you know, asked it, Daniel, or do you think the same way? Uh, so the problem is, uh, like, if we just name a, a scholarship for some person, we can remove their name from uh, from the scholarship at any time. Like, this is like no question asked. Uh, if they violate this um, symbol that they stay, stand for, but the problem is, if they fund it with their money, and then afterwards the bank uh, takes this money from their account that used to be like under their name, and then it would be unfair because we, we use their money to find to fund this scholarship like here is uh what i find controversial on this because not it's not removing their name but because they pay for name their name to stay stay there yeah but you could say okay like oxford i donate like uh, like whatever i'm like uh, let's say um very questionable moral person um donates like uh uh like five million euros to a university of oxford right and like to to and once that one lecture hall should be named after them should oxford just do that or should they also say well no it's incompatible with our values yada yada i think a lot of universe i like i teach at a university for us it is uh, like undoubtedly we would reject such monies so we have to you know in order to be protected from the mob in that sense um so i think the same will be done with scholarships i mean you know like nobody wants to like study with the heinrich himmler like a scholarship or something like that right um so I think this form, like this, this uh, also shows you how, how over time things can be perceived, right? Um, like how different historical figures are evaluated on the grounds. And that's maybe the most dangerous one that we nowadays assume our moral code is maybe the right one. And maybe we can overshoot there. So what I'm claiming, and that's maybe crucial to understand, what I'm claiming is not all um, statues should go down, but statues of serious wrongdoers, like people who violated rights in an obvious manner. Like, for example, like, colonizers like Cecil Rhodes, okay? You don't need even to read much history to understand it. He's questionable. I wouldn't say that Churchill necessarily have to go down. I think this is where philosophy kicks in, where you find out the nuances in public discussion, right? I don't say all statues have to go down, but you have to understand what statues are, and then we have to evaluate what commits this serious wrongdoing, and not like because you were like a terrible husband or something, you like the statues have to go down or whatsoever, because I think most people have like a, a like a traced track record. So that's maybe crucial to understand. I take the last two questions and I also put now in the chat, here are philosophical materials. Like one of my favorite websites just gathered a list of all readings on the topic. So you might want to check that out. Um, and I take the last two questions. First is, um, Anastasia, are there any statues that do not represent any power at all? Or if we put a statue, the semiotic dimension of power, will there be in any way? Yes, I don't. So I think that's right. Like, mo like if my argument is correct, then all statues um, represent power, forms of power. 
even for artistics, like which artists we put up there. It's like a value judgments by those in power, right? To maybe signal something. So once you have that out there, I think that applies to all. But um, my argument doesn't reach that all of them have to be taken down. I don't think it's bad that because they represent certain forms of power. What is wrong with power is when it uh, is linked to serious wrongdoings. And I think this is the interesting discussion to have. And that's where I think liberal democracy kicks in. We have to discuss what is the serious wrongdoing um, and what is not, right? We maybe don't want to take Churchill down, but we want to take Cecil Rhodes down. One is a rights violator. The other one has also committed like questionable things. But overall, I might, I might say that Churchill is um, still an honorable political leader of highest class. But I mean, I could be wrong, but that's up for an argument. And I think uh, there we have to figure out what means serious wrongdoings. I gave one indication. I think clear rights violations is one. So like slave, slave traders are, would be one thing where I say, okay, that's questionable. And then last one, Olga says the slavery, Arist uh, the slavery Aristotle spoke of is not the same as modern slavery. Should we make a difference? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I always say, all my undergrads write in their paper about Aristotle, like Aristotle was a slave, was defending slavery, but he has also other great ideas. That's like how it's like 20% open there their statements. And I say, well, you have to maybe to contextualize. Um, Aristotle talked about natural slavery, which might be even worse than modern slavery. So uh, like he really makes a distinction there that is questionable. But again, like how much emphasis on his whole theory does modern slavery, uh, like natural slavery and his argument about natural slavery have? Uh, scholars have debated that extensively. Like some Aristotelians have defended him and say, well, you know, also irrelevant to his theory and like natural slavery doesn't even have the implications that we should sell people for money. Yada, yada. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to um, uh, how we should perceive of Aristotle's theory of natural slavery. My ultimate thing is it's not it's not relevant to his whole context you can read aristotle without buying into his theory about natural slavery it nevertheless works and that might be different for heidegger where you kind of have to buy into his whole sort of um culture and superiority of some over others so i don't think you can necessarily escape that so i think some thinkers their questionable ideas work without it like for example adam smith he also says something about like the civilized the uncivilized and the civilized but i think his theories work independently of it and for heidegger i'm not so sure for carl schmidt it doesn't work like independently so i think that's maybe the the crucial point where we should make a difference um whether their theories rest upon such very questionable beliefs or whether they didn't maybe that helps Yes, and a really ultimate panel, like super ultimate question, Omori, what should we make of other symbols that don't represent power, like Michael Jackson's statues? I mean, it represents a certain power, maybe not a political power, but social power, like pop music is like oppressive to other forms of music, you might say. But <laughs> like, just like a nice note to think about. Um, if It is totally compatible with my theory, I think. Good, I hope this was uh, helpful to a certain degree, and I hope you enjoyed thinking about this uh, more elaborately. If you want... I share quickly again my screen. There's my email. Oh, wait one second. I think you see the starting thing. You can write me uh, with my private email, not my King's email. I checked the private one more elaborately. So check that out. If you want to have the slides, I guess I will also send the slides to one of the organizers. So you have all of that and you can contact me if there are any like questions for materials. I posted the link with all the stuff that you might want to read on the topic in there. If you read only one piece, it's Helen Fro. Is there a duty to remove um, Statues of wrongdoers. Helen is the University of Stockholm. She's excellent. And uh, I, she's very clearly uh, in her writing. She's very clear in her writing. So you might want to check that out. That's it from my side. I'm all done. <laughs>